Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. With us today is Dr. Anusha Shankar, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Anusha uh, is a Chennai person, but now lives uh, in Ithaca. Yeah. And uh, her interest, besides hummingbirds, is uh, being a woman in science. She has wonderful articles, which we will link to on the in the show notes section of the episode. Um, she loves dancing. And what is uh, um, today we are going to talk about her first passion, which is hummingbirds. So welcome, Dr. Anusha Shankar, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, tell us where hummingbirds are found, because clearly they, we don't see them in India. Um, and tell us a little bit about their ecology as well. Yeah, hummingbirds are found in North and South America. So they're not found in Asia and Africa and Europe and Australia. Um, but we have very ecologically similar species in India called sunbirds, um, which also feed on nectar like hummingbirds do and insects like hummingbirds do, but evolutionarily are, are quite distant from hummingbirds. Um, they've just converged on very similar ecologies. Um, hummingbirds feed, like I said, on nectar, they're primarily nectarivores, but they also feed on insects to get protein. Um, they are capable of hovering flight, which, which not too many birds are capable of, but unlike any other bird, they also can fly backwards. Um, but they're, um, yeah, so they can live in, in deserts in Arizona, they can live in the high elevation mountains, they can live uh, in the Amazon, there's over 330 different species of hummingbirds. Um, and they're most diverse right around the equator in Ecuador and Colombia. Um, so they're really interesting to me because they're very, very small. They're the smallest birds. Um, the smallest hummingbird is the bee hummingbird, which is only found in Cuba. And it weighs less than what used to be the 10 paisa coin, um, which is now a circulation now, but it, it's like 1.5 to 2 grams. And the largest hummingbird is about nine times that at 20 grams. Um, so they're very small uh, and they use up energy very quickly. And so this is an interesting dynamic because they have to stay so light in order to fly that there's a hypothesis that their genomes are smaller than you would expect for their size. They're trying to make their nuclei way less. That's how extreme the selection is on their size. And so they barely store any backup energy in, in the form of fat, but they have very high metabolisms. And so they're constantly trying to balance this energy out versus energy in kind mm -hmm. of equation. Mm -hmm. uh, Which will help all of us who are uh, on the weight watching <laughs> thing. How do you get energy in and energy out? <laughs> Perhaps, yeah, they have some interesting ways of, of avoiding diabetes despite drinking sugar water all day. I think there's a lot of dietary things we can learn from them. Yeah, yeah. So you, uh, from what uh, I read of your work, your, uh, the energy part is one of your main interests in hummingbirds, and you talk about torpor. Um, so, uh, so, so tell us about the energy bit, and also what, what attracted you to hummingbirds? Yeah, the energetics is what's, it is what's interesting to me. Um, I used to think that I would work on snakes and insects. I really wasn't a bird person. I thought they were too mainstream and too easy and too common. I don't know. Um, but the questions that people were asked, sorry. I said, we will not take offense. <laughs> <laughs> I've been converted. So it's all okay. No. <laughs> I've been studying birds for 12 years. So it's, I'm too far gone now to, to go back. But um, at the yeah, they were they were a useful way for me to learn some of the methods that I was really interested in. So my my advisor was working on these physiological questions that were really interesting to me. Um, how do you manage your energetic needs given all the constraints that you have as a bird, as a, such a tiny bird? And they they they're distributed in such different habitats. If if you're able to live in the deserts and in the high elevation mountains and in the Amazon but you have all these energetic constraints of being such a tiny bird with a high metabolic rate. How do you manage your day-to-day -day life? How do you manage your energetic needs and what do you spend time on? What do you spend your energy on? Um, so yeah, forgive easier. me if this is a very simplistic uh, response, but it seems to me that hummingbirds get their main energy from nectar. 
Yeah. And flowers with nectar are found everywhere. So wouldn't it make sense or, or am I wrong? Mm. Um, and uh, so then they use the nectar from the flowers regardless. But you're talking about keeping the body cold and warm, I'm, I'm guessing, right? I, I, I haven't even talked about torpor. No, I'm just, I was just thinking if you're between, like if, if, if they went three or four hours without food, they could be facing death. Um, that's an extreme selection. It's not like a human can go maybe 10 days without food and still survive. But if you're trying to budget, I don't know, you can't go on a long hike if you don't have food with you as a hummingbird. You have to find that food within the, the certain time. And then it changes across seasons. They some, like some hummingbirds migrate thousands of kilometers um, and they have to be sure that they will find food on all their stopover sites. So in the real world, I don't think it's as simple as there will be flowers everywhere because what flowers are they? Is your beak adapted to the flower? Can you get to the nectar that the flower is offering? Um, are they flowering at the right times? Are you able to compete with all the other hummingbirds at the site? At one of my field sites, there were over 20 different species of hummingbirds. And they're all feeding on the flowers in that area because they're all primarily nectar nectarivores. So the real world pressures of being a hummingbird, I can imagine, are, it, yeah, are complicated. Yes. And this hummingbird that migrate uh, is there's one that migrates over water right across the gulf of mexico yeah the ruby-throated hummingbird which is the only one found on the east coast of the us for now um it does migrate across the gulf of mexico we think as far as we know people haven't been able to put trackers on them to measure their roots yet but it seems like they leave mexico and then they end up in florida and so they must be, there's no, there's not too many sightings along the coast. So we don't think that they're going along the coast, but they're probably migrating over the Gulf. And that's a long way to go. Yeah. For a three gram hummingbird. So they double their body weight. They become six grams <laughs> before they, before they fly across the Gulf, which is probably like a, I don't know, 25 paisa coin or a one rupee coin now or something like that. Yeah. My God. Um, so, uh, uh, can we classify hummingbirds? I mean, it, how, do, how does one do it? Because you said there are many species. Do you do it geographically or well, how do you do it? There are nine clades, I think, uh, of hummingbirds. And you, yeah, it's evolutionary. So there's some which are more basal. Uh, and I think there are only three in that most basal group. And then there's, uh, there's a group called the hermits, which have very strange bills and very different wings than the other hummingbirds. And then there's the mountain gems and there's the bees and there's the, I don't remember all of them, but there's one, there's one group which only has one species called the giant hummingbird. And that giant hummingbird is 20 grams when the next smallest, next biggest hummingbird is 10 grams. And then all the others are six to eight to three to whatever. So I think it's mainly because it's classic. So to step back, I think the evolutionary hypothesis for where hummingbirds came from is that there's, there was a fossil that was found in Germany that was thought that's thought to be the, the ancestor of the hummingbird. And people think that the ancestor of the hummingbird migrated through North America, down th to South America, went extinct everywhere else, and then diversified in South America as the Andes were rising. And so they were able to colonize this new ecological niche as the Andes rose and diversify into all these habitats that came with becoming a mountain. Um, and that's where a lot of the diversity still exists today. And then they recolonized North America is the idea. So well, that really shapes how I, we classify, I think, where they are. Uh, lots of the bees are in North America and Central America. Um, yeah, so there is some geography to that evolution. So if one wants one wants to see the maximum number of hummingbirds, where where should you go? Colombia, probably. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Anusha, can you tell us about your work uh, or the various? Just uh, draw it out for us. And I never told you what torpor was, so <laughs> that's that's a huge part of my work now. Okay, um, so we can talk about it now. Yeah. <laughs> torpor is 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 this energy saving strategy because how do you make it through an eight hour or 15 hour night, depending on where, which latitude you're at, uh, when you don't have energy in as a hummingbird. So they're not feeding through the night, but they would presumably have high metabolism still at night. Um, and what they do is they lower the metabolism and they lower their body's temperature and they become cold to save energy at night. So 
many of us are familiar with the term hibernation. Hibernation is like a multi-day, multi-week version of torpor, and hummingbirds use a daily version of that. Uh, so they're able to do this just overnight and then rewarm the next morning and go about their day. Um, and it's an incredible strategy because humans will get what's called hypothermic if we get even two Celsius lower than our normal body temperature. But hummingbirds are able to drop by some 36 Celsius in some species yeah. down to like many species are able to go down to 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, and one species has been found to go down to three degrees Celsius. That's near freezing, right? And their whole body is going through this, their brain, their heart, their lungs, their liver, their skeletal muscle, all of these organs are cooling down and then rewarming. And they have to function optimally the next day. As soon as the hummingbird gets up, it has to go fly and get food. And they're able to go through that huge temperature change and still function. Um, so this strategy is what's really caught my attention and, and my fascination. I'm quite obsessed with finding out how it works. Why does it attract your attention? <laughs> I It just seems like such an extreme capacity for an animal that maintains a normal body temperature during the day. Um, Someone asked me this recently too, why hummingbirds and what about them? It made me step back and wonder because I have been studying them for 10 years. Yes, That's a long time to study something <laughs> and be fascinated by it. So let me prod your uh, introspection. So Please. I read in a book that an astronaut, um, in the book, The Bird Way by Jennifer Ackerman, who has been a guest on our podcast, um, she said an astronaut, I think the name is Kathy Meyer, studies, um, wanted to know how to um, create, uh, work with her metabolism in space. And she went and studied emperor penguins because they are uh, breathers like us, but they go, they take a breath, go deep into water and they become like acrobats. And they use this one breath for like 10 to 12 minutes, for some of them 15 to 20 minutes. And that's a very useful thing for an astronaut to know how to figure out. So essentially, she, she said, I want to figure out how the, I can calm down the nervous system, take longer breaths like the penguins do. This is, longer breaths are just one of the many adaptations. But uh, as a human, I mean, the ability to go into that, whatever the alpha state or the REM sleep, and you're, they go, the hummingbirds go deeper than that. It's not just uh, deep sleep. It's just, uh, no. yeah. It's, it's a different good. state. It's not restful, yeah. I don't think. They yeah. seem, uh, mammals seem to come out of it sleep deprived rather than rested. Um, so a lot of people think it's just a really deep sleep. Oh, I would love to go to torpor. I, no, I don't think so because... <laughs> <laughs> you you would die but if you could not die then your brain function might not be normal when you come back and your heart might not function normally it would be difficult for a human to adapt to um i think yeah i don't there are other aspects of what i've studied about them that i've ended up drawing parallels to my life with uh like how they use their time and allocate their time i think a lot about how i use my time um i started tracking what i do with my time by entering it in an app every 15 minutes. And I did that for more than three years um, to see what I did with my time and see whether I was using it the way I wanted to be using it. And I learned a lot from that. And that's exactly what I was trying to build for, hum for the hummingbirds. And I didn't make that parallel connection until I was asked to give a talk and draw some connection to humans and my life. And I ended up realizing that I was doing the same thing for myself as I was doing with the, with the hummingbirds. Um, and the, and I, I started doing a lot of data tracking on myself after that. I started uh, looking at my mood and what, what it was affected by, whether the weather affected my mood. I think there's a lot of general parallels to being an ecologist that I could draw lessons from in my own life. Um, I still don't have a really good answer for the humming. No, but humming yeah, it, uh, yeah. Why, why are we fascinated by the things we are? So there, you don't need to give an answer, but torpor isn't one of them. So the parallel, so if as a human, we always in this world of takeaways, the takeaway from the hummingbird doesn't, isn't torpor. <laughs> I guess not. Yeah, not yet. I think it has a lot of potential, like in medical application and space flight, uh, torpor can do a lot of things. Yeah. But in my yeah. personal life, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't want to go to another galaxy. <laughs> no, but you said one thing when you talked about parallels, you said, I uh, track how hummingbirds use their time and I try to do that. So how do hummingbirds use their time? 
Yeah, um, it's hard to measure because we can't put a tracker on many of them yet. The trackers are not small enough. So I model that by measuring the energy they spent per unit time and measuring the total energy they spent in a day and then trying to fill in the time part. Um, and I found that their, their activity budget seems to be much, much more flexible than we thought it was. Mm. So I studied one species in Arizona at two different sites and in the pre-monsoon season and after the monsoon. Which, uh, do you remember which the name? I mean, Yeah, this is called the broad-billed hummingbird. Okay, okay. And so it's a, it's a pretty small bird. It's three, 3.5 grams. And um, I was, so we measured their total daily energy expenditure independently using this double isotope method. It's very clever, uh, whoever designed it. And then independently, we used a system called a respirometry system to measure the oxygen from their breath and the carbon dioxide from their breath, which is a good proxy for energy expenditure. And we did that while they were doing different activities. And then we tried to match these two up and say, how much time must they have been spending on hovering, on flying, on perching in the field, in the wild, to be matching this total daily energy expenditure. And we found that they can go from spending between three hours of their day hovering and flying to spending 13 hours of their day hovering and flying. And hovering is one of the most metabolically expensive forms of locomotion on earth and they're spending 13 hours a day doing something like that i spend less than an hour not, a day. Continuously. not necessarily continuously but if it's a 15 hour day and you're spending 13 hours covering and fly that's a lot of time yes and i'm spending less than an hour a day on exercise i learned from from my activity <laughs> budget so that's that's a that's an incredible capacity for flexibility and for activity yeah. And so how did they do that? So is it like the emperor penguins, they figured out how to ma metabolize more? I mean, from the same nectar that they had, the small amount, they just are built in a way that they get more? How what they my, I think that, that they were responding to food availability in their environment. And when the food was more clustered, we looked at the food available in the flower distribution in the environment. And in the pre-monsoon season, when they were spending very little energy, I think there were lots of flowers and they were clustered. It, around the same place. And so the hummingbirds could spend less time flying between sources and looking for food and more time perching. They spent about 75% of their day perching on average at that time. But later after the monsoon started, the resources went down, they were scarce and they were much more distributed. And so the hummingbirds had to spend more time and energy finding and getting between resources than in the pre-monsoon season. So I think they were responding to the food resources, but it meant that they had to take more in to be able to spend more so it's like never ending literally hovering happened because the monsoons and the food resources became scarce is that so evolutionally how did they come up with hovering i think hovering i don't know if, if this is a definitive hypothesis but but our understanding now is that the flowers that they feed on are so delicate and on such thin stalks that the only way to drink the nectar from them is to hover. If you start to perch on them, it'll break the stock um, very often. That makes sense. Um, the other question I had was a good way to understand uh, for a lay person to understand or get fascinated by a species is to uh, learn about the extremes. So you've mentioned the bee hummingbird. I've heard of the sword billed hummingbird. The sword billed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which are some ultra weird, ultra extreme hummingbird species that a person can start with and say, oh my God, they do this. And so if you can name three or four or five. Uh... Yeah, there's definitely a whole bunch of them. Um, the sword billed hummingbird is the strange one, is a very, very strange one because it has a beak that's longer than its body, which is not true of any other bird. So beak to body ratio is big, higher than in any other bird species. Um, the giant hummingbird is very strange among the hummingbirds because it, when it flies, it looks like it's a slow motion hummingbird. It's so big and it perches more than other hummingbirds. It has larger feet than many other hummingbirds do. And it's also present at like many, many different elevations. So a lot of people are studying its um, capacity to live at high elevation. Does it have different hemoglobin? Does it have, what, what, how is it able to survive at those high elevations? Um, Where is this found? Where is the giant hummingbird found? It's found in Peru, in Ecuador. It's found in lots of South America, pretty it's widespread nice. in South America, yeah, yeah. And the sword-billed hummingbird is found also in South. Also, America? also in South America. I've, we, yeah, it was it at some of our 
nearby sites in Ecuador, but I've still never seen it. Okay. Um, slight tangent, where, where, where is your work centered? Um, you, are you mostly Ecuador? During my PhD, I spent a lot of, I spent about a year total in Ecuador. Um, but now during my postdoc, I'm working in Arizona and in Oregon in the US. Okay. Uh, just because I have limited time and I'm not going to export things and do international travel and <laughs> logistically. And what is found in Arizona and what is found in Oregon that takes you there? Uh, Arizona has about 12 species of hummingbirds that mostly are migratory. So they only come up for the breeding season in the summer and then go back down to Central America. And Oregon has Anna's hummingbirds um, among a couple of others, but the Anna's are the most common. And they are really interesting because they've been moving northward and expanding their range northward over the past 10 years uh, and increasing hugely in population size. So there's numbers of Anna's hummingbirds are increasing, but I'm, uh, I'm studying their torpor use and studying how the genes that they're expressing in different states of torpor um, change in organs basically like to see how that heart survives and how the brain survives and how the liver survives. What are they doing when they're so cold? And, and what have you found? I don't know yet. I'm okay. waiting for the it's, data is coming like any day now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when it comes, please send it to us and we'll link to it if, if it's all right. Yeah, of course. I would love that. So which other species use torpor? So basically torpor is going, becoming almost dead is essentially what you're saying. You're functioning at maybe five or 10 or 15% of the normal energy expenditure that you would normally have. Okay. Right. Uh, so it's, yeah, you're, 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 it's really hard for animals in that level of torpor to respond to anything that's going on outside until they warm all the way back up. So hummingbird in torpor is completely oblivious to outside stimuli until it's warmed back up, which takes 20 or 30 minutes. You could poke it and then maybe it'll try to warm up, but it can't do anything about it until it's warmed up. It takes 20 to 30 minutes. And it, it goes into torpor sitting up. Uh, how did they... Yeah, sitting like a normal, like the sleeping position, which is built up and like this. And then as the night gets colder, they start to fluff up and fluff up. And then if they're going into torpor, they actually fluff, unfluff <laughs> and get cold because they're trying to not insulate and allow the outside air to cool their bodies down. So they're becoming ectothermic, basically. They're becoming like reptiles and snakes, which allow the outside air to determine their body's temperature. Wow, okay. Huh. So, mm -hmm. the, so the question was, which other species use torpor, if any? Yeah, so many, many mammal species actually use torpor. Um, you might've heard of bears hibernating. They do a weird version of hibernation because they're so big, they don't get very cold. They only get to 30 degrees Celsius, but they save a lot of energy. Uh, Arctic ground squirrels use extreme versions of torpor. They can go down to mine like zero degrees Celsius or something like that. And they have some anti-freezing mechanisms. Um, among the birds though, there's only three groups that are known to use deep torpor. So hummingbirds, night jars, and mouse birds. Um, mouse, birds. mouse birds, are, which are found in Africa. And these species can drop their body temperature by more than 20 degrees Celsius. There are some other species like some pigeons and some uh, chickadees and a few other species that can drop their temperature by maybe five or six or up to 10, 12 degrees Celsius. But only three groups can use deep topper so far, but only less than 1% of all bird species have been studied for torpor use. Mm -hmm. So we don't even know what most bird species can do. Um, so I'll ask three questions, the final three. Uh, what have I missed? Is there anything else that I, uh, I mean, uh, what you've told me already is so fascinating, but is there an aspect that I've missed asking? And the second question has to do with, you've already alluded to this, what can Topper teach us more broadly? And the last thing which I all ask all our guests is, what are your favorite bird species? So, <laughs> so what have I, have I missed anything, I mean, about this? Extremely fascinating species, sir. Or maybe you want to talk about the hummingbird migrating across the Gulf. How do how does it do that beyond getting uh, fatter? Or... There's a few more interesting things. I think torpor has a lot of applications. Uh, like I think there's particular situations we can use to understand the world better somehow. Like it, do nesting female hummingbirds use torpor? They are the only ones who take care of the young. 
And if they get cold, then their chicks and their developing eggs would get cold, which is often bad for development because it would slow development down. So we were interested in seeing whether female hummingbirds use torpor while they're incubating on the nest. And it turns out they really don't. They seem to avoid it as much as they can. There are rare occasions when they do, when it's raining and it gets really cold or something like that. But mostly they seem to prioritize the development of their offspring over their own energy balance. I don't know how they do that really. I think the nest helps them keep warm and helps them lower the cost of avoiding torpor. Um, and then migration, torpor helps with that too because they can they end up using torpor to gain weight. So it, normally they seem to hummingbirds seem to use torpor at some fat threshold of four to six percent of their body's weight. But when they're getting ready for migration and they're trying to fatten up, they start using it when their body fat is at thirty percent instead. And so, sorry, I didn't understand the last bit. So you said they use it torpor at four to six percent, and then how, what does that mean? That means that it's it's some sort of trigger for that, telling them that they are they now can should enter torpor, but they will have enough energy to warm up in the morning. And so it's usually like a energy emergency situation. Okay, you're getting low in your fat threshold. You can't make it through the night if you maintain a high body temperature. Maybe use torpor now, but we have enough to warm up in the morning. But then when they're migrating, they start using it when they're at 30% body fat, which is a lot of body fat, but their aim is different. It's not just to make it through the night with energy for the morning. It's to put on weight so that they can get fat for migration. Uh, so there's, they switch strategies to help them gain weight for migration. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the interesting applications. And then your second question was about the what we can get out of studying torpor as humans. Um, medical researchers are really working to try to cool humans down safely and rewarm them. And this has a lot of very real world implications for surgeries, for example, um, like in stroke and cardiac patients, uh, researchers are trying to cool the body down safely so that they can do their surgeries with minimal damage to the organs because you gain time. If you slow, if you cool a human down, you slow down their metabolism. And so you have more time to do your surgery without causing damage to the human. Um, but it's really complicated to cool a human down because there are this damage from the cold to the organs that you have to prevent. And so they're trying to study this balance, but there are so many mammals that can do it and a few bird species that can do it. So I think by studying more diverse organisms and how they are able to achieve this cooling and safe rewarming, um, it can teach us a lot about biology and thermoregulation, how you maintain body temperatures, how you change your body temperature and things like that. And then the, I think science fiction fantasy version of it is, to help with human hibernation, to send us to space. Um, so some space space companies are investing in this kind of research and NASA has, start, has started you know, holding symposia to think about how to do this. Because if you don't require food, you don't require, you don't need to urinate, you don't need to go to the bathroom in any way. And you don't need to store food on the ship. You don't need to get rid of carbon dioxide and supply too much oxygen. You can reduce the weight of a spacecraft hugely and send you, like you can go to another galaxy instead of only going to the next planet. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting thing to, to think about. I don't think we'll get there in the next 10 years maybe, but sometimes yeah. science goes. No, your point. You, you earlier said you don't want to go into torpor, but I mean, just to, uh, as a riff of the science fiction, I mean, go into torpor, wake up after Ukraine, whatever is happening happens after four years, or if you don't want, it, don't want an election cycle in America, uh, when Trump gets elected, <laughs> you know, so, so. I've been having a lot of those conversations recently, and it is tempting, but it's it's also a risky thing. I don't know. Would you want to wake up having missed two years of the rest of the world going on and your yeah, family? Yeah. Like, who would be going into torpor? Would it just be you? Yeah, yeah. Would yeah, it be yeah. everyone you know? Or people have been wondering what if we can do that to avoid the pandemic altogether? Um, yeah. But it just goes to show that. Uh, Absolutely, the pandemic, what a, I mean, I never thought of that. But we just, I mean, the more you talk, the more fascinating it is that these guys can do it every 24 hours. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Incredible.
people that uh, oh my god it's like it's like swinging pendulum anyway so um, you have space for me to show you a video of this yes if you want if you and uh, we can definitely so i have this this uh just video of, of a bird in torpor with a thermal video camera okay so this is the video of torpor hmm. mm -hmm. so this is a hummingbird that's not in torpor hmm. this is where its eye is and this is its bill and this is the tail and it's breathing normally and its heart is beating normally it's at a high body temperature it's you can see the surface temperature is at about 35 degrees celsius which is normal and high and then the same individual, this is a black chinned hummingbird from Arizona. This is the same individual later that same night. And its whole body is cold. You can you have to squint to find where the hummingbird is, right? Oh, yeah. So it's all... The screen is blank, but there it is. <laughs> yeah, this is a video and it's playing. So the hummingbird is barely moving. It's barely breathing. Its heart is barely be beating. It's only, I can play it again. You play it again, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the beak. And this is the tail, and this is the eye, and its whole body is at about 16 or 17 degrees Celsius. And then it warms up to be just like that first video and goes about its day the next morning. Huh. Staying still for that 17 seconds itself is hard. And these guys burn <laughs> it and then some. So they go from which Celsius to which Celsius? The normal is 40, 40 to 41 degrees Celsius, and the coldest recorded is 3 degrees Celsius. Holy God. But the average for most species is around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. In 30 minutes, they just bring themselves down that much. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Anything else that you would like to share before you address the last question of what are your favorite bird species? I know everybody says I have no favorites, but it's really <laughs> call out for us to say, you know, hey, look at this, look at this one, look at this one. <laughs> That's exactly what I usually say, but um, I don't think there's, too, there's anything else. I love, uh, among hummingbirds, the booted racket tail is one of my favorites. The it has little tail. Hmm. booted racket tail, yes. It has little white boots and it has a long thin tail, like a racket tail drongo. It has a really long tail with a, ra with a little rachis, what is it called? Like the little feather thing at the end. Um, and it's such a disproportionately long tail for the body size. This is a tiny little bird and it's, it, it buzz feeds at the feeder with its tail up and its body up, but then the, the head down, it's just such a cute bird. Um, but among other birds, I love quetzals and hornbills. I studied hornbills for my masters and I have a special fondness for them. Where did you, where did you go to see the hornbills? I worked at a field site in the Ratnagiri district in Maharashtra. Okay. Um, yeah. I was at Valparai recently to see the hornbills. <laughs> the, uh, the great ones, the great hornbills? Yes. Yeah. Indian. In, Indian. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, Anusha, there are uh, other birds that hover, and I've seen them the pied kingfisher hovers. And so uh, uh, is the hummingbird hovering just a more extreme, and you, as you said, the sunbirds I've seen. So it's uh, hummingbird is just a more extreme level of that hovering, is that? I think the, the, the biomechanics of how they do it are a little bit different, um, but it's their ability to also go backwards and maneuver in all kinds of other ways. I think that's most unusual. There are hub birds, like you're saying, when they're, especially when they're hunting, that hover above the ground to go down. Hummingbirds are, doing this figure of eight hovering. So they do this instead of the flapping that we're used to. Um, and I think that's unusual for them. They're also, they, they can also sustain it for a really long time. So Dr. Anusha Shankar, thank you so much for being part of the Bird Podcast. Thank you, I really enjoyed this. We'll tell you when it comes out. I love that, yeah. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.